Hello, and welcome to the Voice of Reason podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's guest is Lara Ayad, who is a professor of art history and a researcher into art history. Specifically, her research dives into Egyptian art history, and I believe the 1930s is her purview right now at this point in time. We talk about art history. We talk about the differences between the American dream and the Egyptian dream. We also talk a lot about men and women, masculinity and femininity. This is one of those conversations that is wide ranging, quite polite. And I don't I'm not going to say it's absolutely necessary to key into, but it was really delightful. So we got that going for us, right? Without further ado, let's just dive right in to the conversating with myself and Laura Ayad. So how's it going? Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm all right. Um, I remember you promised um, one minute of cat time last time. Oh, I did? you have a cat to show me? <laughs> um, the cat will be in and probably will uh, ruin our recording if I don't okay. manhandle it to sleep. So oh, when okay. he announces himself, he'll come in. And if not, I'll, I'll go grab him. Awesome. But right now he's entertaining the other cat or scaring the bejesus out of her. Right, right. It's not like dogs, right? Dogs, like, you just sort of command them, but cats have their own will altogether. You got to well, just let them come to you. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. There's puppies. Well, here he is. There's puppies and there's kittens, um, which are different than cats and dogs. So here's the uh, here's the kitten. Oh. He is. Wait, where's the camera? He He's uh, about 10 weeks old. What's one. his name? Uh, it's Bodie. Bodie. That's a cute name for a cat. Yeah, it's an ancient uh, Nordic name. That's the name of the god's pet, or the king's pet, or something like that. Well, he's enjoying being on the video, clearly. <laughs> he steals the show as yeah. often as he can. If not yeah. by perching on me, then by uh, going behind my computer and unplugging things. That's which hopefully awesome. he won't do. I have this theory that cats are aliens from outer space that have come here to enslave us and make us happy so wasn't that a disney uh movie or wait that's an ancient uh egyptian religious doctrine isn't it i don't know why i don't know if the ancient egyptians believe that bastet who's the feline goddess you know came here to enslave us and make us happy but they <laughs> liked her so <laughs> is it is it true or is it um goddess a lie of historians that in one war the enemies of the Egyptians unleashed cats on the battlefield and the Egyptians ran away. Is that, do you know if that's true or not? No. Have please. you never heard of that? No, I've never heard oh, of it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Oh, no. That's funny. You're, I guess you don't, you're not completely omniscient when it comes to Egyptian no. myths and legends. No, no. Yeah, but that's the thing about legends, too, right? Is they're always a mix between fantasy and reality, but that's kind of the whole point of a legend. Yeah. How's your semester? It's crazy, but it's good. It's all online. Um, and things have actually been going a little better than I anticipated, which is great. It means my hard work, you know, teaching online classes has paid off, and students seem to be doing pretty well, and I'm slowly getting you know, the groove on research and things like that. So it's been it's been tough because I don't get to see colleagues in person at all and that can be really tough, but yeah, it's, it's been okay. Is uh, what you're studying or your research, is that online or do you miss out on some archival mm -hmm. interaction? Well, you know, the first couple of articles I've been trying to draft are based on research that I already did in person in Egypt, and I have a lot of archival material already. Oh. Um, I would like to go back to Egypt eventually in about maybe two years from now, if possible, to do some follow-up research. But I have, like, a lot of content and material to write off of for this point, because I was in Egypt for 10 months, you know, 12 months or something like that, and I was very diligent about just collecting as much information as I could. So hmm. what's yeah. your thesis or uh, I don't know if thesis is the proper uh, term for your design. What's the point of, or yeah, the... well, you know, I kind of mentioned a little bit before in our first conversation about my work on representations of the Egyptian peasant 
and art and how I was looking at a lot of paintings and sculptures that were made for an agricultural museum in Cairo. Yeah. So a lot of the first couple of articles that I'm writing, I'm working on my third manuscript draft now or third article uh, draft. Um, they're focused on representations of the peasant, um, meanings of modernity, meanings of a cultural authenticity more widely, gender representation. So if I were to try to summarize what a lot of them do, I would generally like identify that through line. How do you think, what's the major difference between um, modern American gender representation and the gender representation uh, that you're studying? Is there a big difference that you're aware of? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm looking a lot at like the 1930s, right? So, okay. so if we were to compare with with modern American gender representation, it would have to be with American art from the 30s as well, because then okay. otherwise it would be anachronistic. I mean, I would say there's actually some similarities. Um, we talked a little bit before about like the allegory and how sometimes representations of women are actually representations in Egyptian art are not representations of um, individual identifiable women like famous singers yeah. or politicians or whatever. They're usually these kind of abstract embodiments of, of, an, of an abstract idea like Egypt the nation, you know, Egypt as a woman. Um, and in American art of the 1930s, you see some of those allegorical figures operating in painting and sculpture too. So there are some similarities. Um, but you know, in the 1930s in America also, I don't, I'm not an expert on modern American art, but something I have noticed is that they tend to deal very differently. Artists at that time were dealing very differently with uh, the realities of the Great Depression, as well as race and race relations hmm. at the time. Hmm. So they were dealing a little more with those kinds of ideas directly and um, I think in Egypt, you know, the, the Great Depression affected Egypt, too, and this was a global depression, but they just dealt with it in very different ways, not quite as directly, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Is there a concept? Well, what's the concept of race within Egypt, and how is that different than in America? Yeah. Uh, so I can tell you, I, I can tell you that even today, ideas of race in Egypt are rooted in much earlier 18th, 19th century ideas of race. And that's partially rooted in systems of slavery all along the Nile in East Africa, and uh, as well as uh, their intersections with religious identity. Um, yeah. I don't know if we yeah. talked about that last time, but basically uh, there is, there is um, this idea of an exclusive or unique Egyptian race, but how people today identify that in the sort of wider picture or umbrella of humanity, some Egyptians try to argue that this unique Egyptian race is essentially white and that we're Caucasian somehow, which oh, I'm very skeptical about because I think it's rooted in I think that's very much rooted in um, a lot of popular anxieties about being associated with Africa. Because if you look at Egypt on a map, it's in Africa. Yeah. And yes, it is a part of the Middle East, and it's been an important part of the Middle East. The, you know, the Middle East spans multiple continents, right? Yeah. Um, I think that, but I think that there's, so there's a tendency among Egyptians, especially I think middle-aged and older Egyptians, to identify Egyptians as white, even though they say, well, we're uniquely Egyptian. And then, um, on the other hand, there are some Egyptians who say, well we're, well, we're specifically Arab, right? We're a part of the Arab world. We speak Arabic. Our, our ancestors hail partly from Arabia and partly from the Nile, and we're unique in that way. Um, and then what you see, unfortunately, today in Egypt, and this is rooted in those systems of slavery I've mentioned earlier, is this very vehement anti-black racism there. Oh, okay. Uh, um, and I think people have traditionally associated being black with being part of a sort of a, a real underclass, like a slave class. And um, this is complicated, though. This is a little different than the American understanding of blackness and its relationship with race, though, because in Egypt, traditionally, even if, say, 
your ancestors come from, quote unquote, in Arabic, the land of the blacks or Bilad de Sudan, as it was called in Arabic in the 18th, 19th centuries. So let's say your ancestors came from there. Technically, maybe your ancestors were enslavable, but if you identify and say, I'm a practicing Muslim and I'm a believer, that exempts you from slave status if people believe you, right? That's where that religious intersection comes in. Or if you're Christian too, I think that also tends to protect you from slave status. But if you're coming from a part of Southern Sudan or parts of like Northern Uganda where people practice other kinds of religions beyond the Abrahamic ones, hmm. uh, you were susceptible and very, and very vulnerable at the time uh, to, to being enslaved and, and being you know taken all the way down the Nile northward to parts of Egypt to work as a menial laborer, as a slave, as a house servant. So, um, so there are these like kind of like long standing ties in people's minds between what it is to be black, your relationship with Africa, and then these kind of different slave and class statuses. Has there been uh, something similar to the civil rights movement in Egypt, or have some of the ideas, the American ideals, or the Enlightenment so-called ideals of uh, a, all, all men created equal, like that, that very uh, you know, basic equality under the law, has that been working out in Egypt, and how? I'm, I'm laughing just because has that been working out? A lot of Egyptians would say no. Uh, a lot of younger Egyptians, I think, would say no. Um, and in fact, what you I, I don't think that there's something that's equivalent to like this American civil rights movement. There has been a little bit of budding awareness, an emerging sort of conversation about the status of what are called quote unquote black people in Egypt, mostly people who come from parts of Sudan but there's, I mean, I don't know if you know, but there's, there's been a refugee crisis in parts of Sudan going on now for, for almost decades. And a lot of refugees recently have been fleeing to different parts of North Africa and the Middle East. That includes Egypt. And, uh, and what I understand from reading different news articles and looking into it is uh, Sudanese refugees are, are they're treated like garbage in Cairo. I mean, they're really not only subjected to slurs and taunts when they're walking on the street, but the, also there are cases where people, Sudanese people just literally go missing, like somebody kidnapped them or somebody or people act enact in violence in, against them or few cases of even like murders. So, uh, they really, I mean, unfortunately, I think we really need to amplify our critical discussions of racism and particularly anti-black racism in Egypt because it's a big problem and, and we are hardly even a fraction there in terms of, hmm. if you want to compare it to that American civil rights movement. I mean, there just really needs to be, I will say though, Benjamin, um, during the 1960s, when I think about like, certain intellectuals and artists that were active in Egypt at the time, there were a couple that were starting to become really interested in, one, the civil rights movement in the United States, and then two, which was much more, this was much closer to them, the second point, is like the relationship between pan-Africanist and pan-Arab sort of politics and ideals that emerged around the 50s and 60s. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you know anything about that, but but pan, no. like Pan-Africanism is this idea that emerged right around the very end of colonial European colonial rule on the continent that all peoples of African descent have not only a sort of shared history in their experience with European colonialism in their respective countries, but they also have a sort of shared goal and a shared future, right? So yes. our goal in Pan-Africanism is to liberate African nations, to ensure that they have their own agency in determining their own political goals, their own economic self-sufficiency, their own international ties with other African as well as other Asian nations for that matter. Um, and you might've heard of the Bandung Camp Conference in 1955. Yeah, so the Bandung Conference took place in, in Indonesia in 1955. And it was, uh, a, you know, basically a grouping of all these different leaders of newly independent nations in Africa and Asia that would all get together. And that include, included the first president of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser. And he got together with all of these different um, national political leaders to discuss how they can 
create and enact a pan-African and pan-Asian agenda and an alliance hmm. between these post-colonial nations. So, How has so, that worked out? Uh, you know, this is something I'm still trying to figure out. And actually, this is a topic that I'd really like to explore, not right now, but for future journal articles that I want to write. Um, because I've traditionally been focused a lot on the 1930s and the Great Depression era, hmm. I'm going to be moving forward now with this pan-Africanism, pan-Arabism. You'd have to move forward into the Cold War period, right? Okay. And that's going to entail a certain, um, a, a bit of a recalibration, but it's nevertheless connected to earlier periods as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I can tell you is that even though I don't know exactly how this is panned out, and I, I quite frankly think that... <laughs> And a lot needs to be done. Um, Nasser, the president of Egypt, was, with all of his flaws, you know, uh, he was very much, at least by word, in support of pan-African and pan-Arab relationships and the sort of ties between Egypt as a post-colonial nation and, that, and those of other African nations. And in fact, he was very, very close friends with Kwame Nkrumah, who was president of Ghana in West Africa at the time. And Kwame Nkrumah even showed some of his allegiances with or alliances with uh, countries like Egypt by marrying an Egyptian woman and having a family with her. So just some very, yeah, like these are things that people don't tend to talk a lot about. Um, when people think about Nasser and they think about Egypt in the Cold War, they'll usually talk about pan-Arabism and then the conversation ends there. But I'm more, I'm kind of interested to know a little more about these ideals of pan-africanism you know did they did they play out in tangible ways in yeah. egypt at the time um so really really fascinating stuff that i'd love to explore more going forward that kind of ties into a question that i was thinking about about is there an egyptian version of the american dream is there something in the distance or some future destiny that uh, codifies what the nation is or is it kind of more rooted in ethnic identity or uh, past identity uh. see well can i get some clarification to you what like then if if you're saying that the American dream is not so much rooted in a past identity. Can you kind of clarify for me, just so I'm on the same page with you, what you mean by the American dream? The, that's a very good question. Uh, the American dream is constantly being updated. I think there can be a version of it that isn't rooted in a identity, uh, but there's a lot of discourses right now that I'm looking at that look at whiteness and that are critical discourses trying to unpack what this Americanism is, what is this whiteness, and I think that it's a misstep to tie the ideals and the identity of America as something that everybody can be a part of to the past identity of it. Uh, we, I think that there's a way for us to foster a tradition that comes that has been passed down to us that does originate in Europe. But if you go back further, there's the, the ideas mix, you know, all the way back into history. Um, I think that there's an ability or a need for America to uh, kind of formulate a national, uh, you know, uh, direction, a dream, uh, that it supersedes uh, ethnicity, that, and, and that's probably a part of what it is it kind of baked into America. Egypt not having the same history, um, and then you have colonialism, and then you have a very present, ancient uh, presence. Um, how does how what is the Egyptian dream? I, I guess is that what, what's the goal? Is there a destiny, kind of a manifest destiny? Um, that's a great question. So that helps that. Thank you for that. Cause that really helps to clarify. I think that I'm hinting what, what you were saying before, Benjamin, I think that if there is kind of any Egyptian I think, vision of where a lot of folks in Egypt think Egypt should go, mm -hmm. it's rooted much more in an ethnic identity and it's rooted much more in a, in an ancient past. Uh, because we don't have that, we don't have a history of massive amounts of immigration, for instance, the way that America does, at least one that's not lasted very long. I don't know if you know, but 
During World War II, Egypt was actually a safe haven for many intellectuals, many Jews, many people mm -hmm. fleeing Europe during the World War II period, during Nazi occupations, and they actually came and settled in cities like Alexandria and Cairo. Mm -hmm. So, and in addition to the fact that Alexandria, Cairo, Port Said, all these major cities were actually major immigrate, like migrant sites for people coming from, you know, northern Sudan, from Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, different parts of the Middle East, like Syria and Lebanon. Many people from different parts of the world were settling between the 19th and the early 20th centuries in Egypt. And so it was actually like a lot of the cities, especially in the, the major port towns, were very cosmopolitan in that way. But I think that when Gemal Abdel Nasser became president, he did some good things, but one of the big mistakes he made was to, he tried to put the power um, in controlling the economy, the newspapers, the media, back into the hands of native Egyptians, which I understand because foreigners had been controlling Egypt for literally thousands of years, right? I mean, this is a hmm. part of the world that's been colonized by yeah. the the Nubians and then the Romans and then the Greeks and then the, the Assyrians and the, the Persians, the list goes on and on. So, right. So this is a, this is a part of the world that's been colonized for so long, way beyond the history of Europe in the 19th century. Yeah. So I get where he was coming from and trying to like, be like, no, now Egyptians gain control of our education system, our ministry of culture, our economics, our like news and journalism, the state literally started controlling the media. Right. Um, the problem with this is, one, you start getting a set of limited perspectives in, say, the news or journalism, but you also, you also witness Nasser, like, literally kicking whole group, ethnic groups of people out who had been in Egypt for generations, and that includes oh. some of the Jews, Egyptian Jews who had been there for, you know, multiple generations, um, I could kind of understand why, like, where he would kick out some of the British, say, because the British were occupying the country as a military, uh, as a as a military force, and we're just leeching off of Egypt's natural resources during wartime and yeah. oppressing people, right? But there's also this other side of it where he also um, he kind of took he sort of um, whittled away at the cosmopolitan nature of these cities by compelling certain groups of people or forcing certain groups of people to leave, and that includes like some of the Syrians who had been there a long time, some of the Jews that had been there for many generations. And I think that that was one of the few big mistakes that he made. So this is, this is all to say to circle back, this is all to say that I think that has a big impact on how we can define this Egyptian dream. And if there's an equivalent to an American dream, because unfortunately Egypt's just not as diverse in ethnic and cultural backgrounds as a country like America. And I think that has a major impact on people's ability in Egypt to envision something like a, a manifest destiny or a dream. There's also, too, a cultural difference as well. It's not yeah. just a difference in my, my, uh, histories of migration, but there's a difference, too, in culture. Americans have this unique quality to them, this optimism, the sense of, okay, well, if there's a problem, we'll do this about it, and then maybe we'll be able to fix it, right? This, this is kind of known as this American optimism that people, especially from other countries, notice. Hmm. E Egyptians and many people in other parts of the world, all over the Middle East and even parts of Africa, have um, this kind of fatalism. So there's this idea that, well, you know, you can't really change the way things are. It's in God's hands. You know, you might hear somebody who's an Arabic speaker say, inshallah, you know, with, with God's will, right? And they say it for everything. And it's a, it's a sort of a form of speech, right? You hear it all the time. But something like that is rooted in these kind of deeper ideas about how much can you really control your destiny? How much can you really control your future? Can you really change the way things are? Can you really challenge a status quo? I don't want to make too many generalizations because there are so many Egyptians, including ones that I know, that are working so hard to make things better for people's quality of life in Egypt, for instance, who want to speak out against oppression, who want to improve the status of women, who want to challenge anti-Black racism in Egypt. Um, but unfortunately, they are also fighting such an uphill battle because 
the popular attitudes in Egypt tend to be there, there isn't this kind of ambition to make deep changes that's really widely accepted by the culture the way that there is in America. And I think that really has an impact on whether or not you can identify that Egyptian dream versus an American one. And if there is one, how far can it really go? And who really holds that in their own imagination, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense? How does that impact... Uh culture creation then is it more of a curatorial process rather than an infinite experimental process or are the changes in the themes of artists slower is progress slower Uh, yeah um geez i mean some people would argue that um the arts so i'll back up and just say Part of the, what you see in the art scene today, because you asked about culture creation, and of course, yeah. I know that there's things like film, media, TV. A culture can be understood more widely. I'll tell you a little bit about more the sector that I know, which is the visual arts and the fine arts. Um, the Ministry of Culture, that's part of the government, has traditionally been the biggest patron of art exhibitions and artist residencies in Egypt since at least the 1940s or 1950s. That's traditionally been the case, and usually when artists are going to art school, for instance, and they're getting their education, the first source for help that they're gonna turn to usually is some division of the Ministry of Culture. That could be the division of plastic arts, or the division of fine arts, or whatnot. And they're oftentimes these ministries and institutions are responsible for exposing artists' work, putting them on exhibition, having an annual Cairo salon. It's still going on to this day. Has very early roots in the 1920s. Um, so th- because the government has a tendency to really kind of control the mainstream production of the fine arts in Egypt. There is a particular kind of agenda that they do tend to push, in my opinion, and I could get in a lot of trouble actually for saying this if I ever do go back to Egypt, which only proves my point more. Um, They have a tendency to sponsor artists that um, create works that sort of recycle a lot of older themes, like our ties as Egyptians to the ancient pharaohs, and you'll see like references to ancient Egypt in the work, or you know, uh, like, you know, realist landscape painting or like, you know, traditional portraiture, which is what a lot of the sort of celebrated pioneers, quote unquote, of the fine arts school in Egypt were creating in the 1910s and 1920s. And yeah. that's fine. I'm not denigrating that. I think that, you know, you need you need room for those more traditional kinds of ideas, those traditional modes of art making, if you want to talk about culture. But, uh, but, but, there are some artists that do try to really start kind of tackling big issues in new kinds of ways in the arts and they will find sponsorship and funding and exhibition at like more independently run usually kind of foreign connected or foreign owned art galleries like townhouse gallery in cairo there's rawabit theater for dance i don't know if it's still around there's been rumors that the Egyptian authorities have been like trying to ransack these places for years now. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah. So, are they threatened by it, or? It's a that's a great question. I really don't know a lot of details. Rumors okay. were floating around, so I don't want to set it in stone. But uh, but so so that's kind of that's kind of an, an issue, and it, a lot of times the folks in. Uh, the Ministry of Culture who are making a lot of decisions to say like they'll have like they'll hold the Cairo salon and they'll choose which artists they want to feature and which ones not. A lot of the people making these judgments, they've they've been at the fine arts school for like many decades. They're older, they're an older generation, they're almost all men. Uh, And they just have a certain idea of like, they grew up in a different generation. So they have an idea of what constitutes good art and any artists that don't fit that idea, they just don't get that kind of exposure. And I think that that can be limiting. Again, I don't want to denigrate it though. I mean, some of these, some of these same individuals are the same people who generously helped me uh, do my research when I was in Egypt. And they were just so happy to see other people just interested in the state of the arts in Egypt, period. So Mm -hmm. I don't want to also go and make like blanket statements about people. I want to be careful about that. Uh, 
But that is a pattern that I notice. And I think I think we're getting there. I think there is development in the arts in Egypt, but whatever artists are doing something a little new, they have a tendency to be getting a little more exposure through kind of international or Western venues for art exhibition, whether that's a an institution that's just located in Cairo, or if they get exhibited internationally, for instance, at like major museums and galleries in Berlin or Paris or London. So do they end up speaking mostly to uh, foreigners then and not really speaking to uh, Egypt? That's a really good question. Um, Some people would say that these artists are, you know, if people were to criticize some of these younger artists, say, oh, well, they're just pandering to foreigners, you know, they're not really speaking to Egyptians, but, but I think that depends on who you ask. Um, I think that to an extent, artists do need to, by the very economics and nature of the art market, they do need to pay attention to who their intended audience is. And so if, if you, if you as an artist feel that you're, that you're only going to get exposure uh, if you're not going to get exposure from, say, the Ministry of Culture, well, then you've got to turn to these foreign organizations and institutions. And what are they looking for in modern Egyptian art? Uh, they oftentimes tend to look for like stuff that's like about like Islam and women and like, yeah. you know, or like they love like stuff with Arabic writing all over it. So I think that sometimes artists in the Middle East, not just Egypt, but in other Arabic speaking countries and other Middle Eastern nations kind of like, they have to fall. They, they get sometimes pigeonholed within a stereotype in the context of these, like European and, and American exhibitions of artists from this region. Hmm. Um, like if you, I don't know if you've ever heard of Shirin Nishat. She's an Iranian artist. Um, I can share her her name after with you. But if you look up her work, like you can kind of see why she's just become like internationally renowned for her work because it is beautiful, high quality work, but also has a tendency to like play into the stereotypes of what a lot of Americans think of when they think of like Muslim women, which is like veiled, repressed. Mm. There's lots of, you know, Farsi and Arabic writing all over it. There's like images of guns and references to the totalitarian regime in Iran and all this stuff. I mean, it, and so it's not to say that it has no value. It's just, I think the artists that tend to get a lot of exposure uh, in these West, mostly Western venues, they have to fit a certain kind of aesthetic uh, in order to. Now, whether Nishat herself tried to pigeonhole herself into that, I cannot make any claims to that. And I wouldn't want to go and make any assumptions, but, but it's something that I've noticed in my own research and just interacting with artists and going to exhibitions. I've noticed it. In America, we have a very particular, uh, particularly rapid trajectory of uh, these ideas that we're, you know, that put us into motion. Uh, they come up again and we, uh, we have miniature revolutions. We have a lot of protests and stuff like that. And that happens on all these different fronts. We're constantly protesting. We're, we're very Protestant in our, in our uh, dealing with uh, different matters. And we're trying to, we're always, it seems like we're on a treadmill, but we're always kind of searching for something new or, uh, you know, or something better, maybe. Uh, in your research with regards to Egyptian art, and hopefully we can break out of just the domain of art and what art is talking about, is there that same um, drive or need, uh, it, even if it is suppressed or, like you say, kind of uh, weighted by a fatalism, is there a trajectory of progressive? progressivism in the domain of of women's rights, let's say, or in the way that uh, the just the images of male and female are changing or developing? Is there a sense of development or is there a sense of mutation? And in what direction has it been going? Yeah, um, I can only answer this partly for you because I haven't been in Egypt for at least five years now. And Things might have changed a bit since then. I'm, I'm not regularly watching Egyptian movies or regularly keeping up on the news, for instance. So I don't want to like give you the impression that I'm an all-knowing or omniscient okay. force on this. So, um, And I would love to hear what other folks who are specialists in Egypt or are there today would think of, of your question. But um, I think we've got a really long way to go in terms of thinking more broadly about what men and women mean to us there and 
what kinds of things women can and can't do. There are, um, I, I think there's there's a lot of ideas about about honor and sexuality that are very traditional in Egypt that that really limit what women can and can't do. Um, even in, like when you're walking on the street in Cairo, it's like harassment's just like really really just ubiquitous and it's really awful and there's this idea that like a woman should not be out in public unless she's like with a man kind of like with you know a male family member and if she's alone like it's kind of she's fair game um and you know it's it's not like that bad all the time but it's a it's something you see over and over there that's just one example of ways in which i think attitudes towards women are, are very regressive there um not to mention the fact that women don't have as many job opportunities they have less access to formal education and literacy than men do so that's a, that's a big barrier um but there are groups of people in Egypt who are really trying to change things. Like one great example is there's a division of the United Nations called UN Women that's based in Egypt. And I actually know the person who's been directing the program for a long time. And they're really trying to not only help um, understand the challenges that women face in Egypt, but they're also one of their side projects is to help develop healthier attitudes towards like masculinity and what manhood means in Egypt and different parts of the Middle East. Hmm. So, um, yeah, they're trying to like kind of, kind of tap into and understand like what sorts of attitudes about women and about men might be unfortunately perpetuating some of these inequalities, like the idea that a man, you know, he must be the one to control his wife. And if his wife acts up, he has the right to beat her. Yeah, a lot of Egyptians believe that, yeah, like that's that's totally legit. And it's I hate saying that out loud, but it's just like that's an accepted idea there, as it is in actually many parts of the world. So um, so so so, you know, different institutions like you and women are trying to do that. But there's also more kind of grassroots efforts like something online called Harass Map. And Harass Map is this online application where um, women or anybody can report an instance of harassment and show where they were located hmm. uh, so that so that so that grassroots organizations as well as uh, law enforcement can gather data about where do these offenses tend to take place are there certain individuals that tend to be con committing them more often than others and to help kind of uh, gather data to help put a stop to this and it also helps people who have survived very incessant harassment or violence on the street to feel like they're not alone too. Yeah. yeah. Um, because we're not just trying to, they're not just trying to turn these women and these people to statistics. They're trying to also give a sort of a, an anonymous voice, right? Because if a woman comes out and speaks out about the violence or harassment she's dealt with, she runs at the risk of being blamed for it. Um, what were you wearing? You were asking for it, so on and so forth. So, so certain types of grassroots efforts like Harass Map have been one of the ways that people are really trying to progress this conversation uh, about about women and women's bodies, and I think to a certain extent about masculinity, albeit not directly. What are some of the ideas that you've heard of that? Uh you said something about changing attitudes towards male and female. I wonder if a lot of my own history, my own cultural history, I'm kind of blind to. I don't know all the different steps that my own culture took to get me to a place where I have a certain sort of normative behavior towards women um, and that harassment is something I generally try to avoid to such an extent that I'm seeing it around every corner in case I get accused of it, right? Um I, well, I'm just saying that there's kind of a trigger button in the West to kind of police each other's behavior. Uh, I, I think that we kind of have we can go a little too far in the West in policing each other's behavior um, and, and getting a little too uptight. And that might be a part of what helped us to uh, kind of uh, formulate these social mores. But when you think about trying to change a culture that harassment of women is acceptable, what are some of those ideas? that kind of reformulate uh, that behavior, like chivalry or, or something like that. Is there that? Is that Is what you're talking asking about? asking if there are certain ideas, particularly around men, that might help to make that change? Or do yeah. you mean in general? Yeah. And, and do, does it start with uh, reconceptualizing the male? And how do you go about doing that? Or what yeah. are some of the things? Yeah. Um, so I definitely, I mean, and, and this is just my opinion, I definitely think we need to have... Um, we emailed each other about this a little bit before. 
we need to have a, a, a build up an, an, uh, an idea of positive masculinity, because I think that uh, traditionally, and I think especially in Egypt, too much of men's identities and their sense of manhood has been really reliant on uh, controlling women's sexuality and controlling like where women can and can't go. And so I'll give you an example, like in a lot of more traditional families, if a young woman wants to just like go out to get something at the store or buy something, and this tends to happen more in rural areas than in cities, just to clarify, she's not gonna go alone. Her brother is gonna be her chaperone. Even if her brother is younger than she is, she could he could be like a boy and she could be almost a grown woman. But traditionally the brother is like the kind of the custodian of the women's sexuality, particularly his sisters, right? So this is a very traditional setup, right? Hmm. If we started thinking instead about, cause chivalry doesn't really translate so much in Egyptian culture. It's more like concepts of honor because there's like shut off for men, which is a particular kind of honor that you accrue for yourself through good acts and also through your ability, again, to control <laughs> women's sexuality and the honor of the family that she embodies. And I think I've mentioned that before. Um, I think if instead we were to base uh, a, a masculinity that was um, that maybe honored differences between men and women while also understanding that you shouldn't use those differences as a weapon to control the basic rights of others and or, or reduce the humanity of others, I think that's a really good starting point, which I understand is a pretty, it's a pretty general idea. But, mm -hmm. um, but I think that that's a really good way to start. And to also, you know, to understand that like young men, men and, and boys and young men can, they can honor and understand, a, a, you know, something that makes them distinct from women, something that that is the flesh or the 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 soul of their masculinity, right? The, what their masculinity is, um, and understand that difference without it being something where, in order to maintain or defend it, you have to oppress somebody else. And I hmm. think that that's a really, I think that's the direction we need to start going. And that's not just in Egypt. I think that's everywhere. Um, there has to be a positive masculinity and a positive femininity. I think we, I think we hear the term toxic masculinity thrown around a lot. And I think the original intention of, of bringing about this term and starting a conversation about it was good. I think the intentions were good because people were trying to say, Hey, you know, um, you know, boys don't just act in a vacuum. Sometimes we teach them certain ideas that actually may be harmful or detrimental, not only to women, but they may be detrimental as well to men, right? The idea that boys should never cry. The only emotions they should ever show are just anger or happiness, or the idea that, you know, if they just feel like touching a woman or taking her, they just could just do it. And they're just completely entitled to that. But those are that, you know, they were trying, I think the people who were trying to come up with this term toxic masculinity had the good intention of showing, well, that that's wrong. And there are other ways to be in the world. The problem is that alternatively, we haven't yet really fleshed out for ourselves what positive, positive masculinity should look like and what exactly that is. I don't think we've had as much room in our culture and time to really think about what that means. Um, hmm. I think as a result, we've ended up disproportionately focusing on, well, we don't want men to be like this and we don't want them to do that. And this is how they're negative and this is how they're destructive. And like, okay, yeah, like 98% of all people who commit violent crimes against women are men. Like, so that's not like statistically, this is totally like out of bounds. Yeah, but what percentage of men are make up that 98% of? I'm sorry? But the, the percentage of men that do those assaults is very, very small. Right. Okay. So, so and this kind of gets to the point of, okay, so where can we find a space for men to think about and talk very honestly without judgment about what it means to be a man and how can I live in the world as a man in such a way that I can honor my masculinity and honor that difference between myself and maybe other men or other or, or women specifically without it being a tool that 
is negative and destroys. And I, I think we just don't, we need to, to build some more time and space for conversations mm. like that. I wonder if it's the case that it those discussions are there. They just don't have theoretical language uh, tied to them. But they're just in our stories. They're in our media. They're not created out of uh, the length, the same, uh, I guess, uh, lineage uh, that the critiques of our culture have come down to us from. There's this critical uh, dialogue that talks about culture and talks and usually focuses on the negative or is adapted um, out of the academy, out of wherever the ideas come from by activists who then employ it in order to gain or to play some sort of political game that aren't really necessarily about building up society. They're about changing society to or rearranging society in a certain way. I just wonder if there there isn't the uh, positive or there isn't the negative to toxic masculinity because it's already there and we just don't really talk about it necessarily or it's not it's not even talked about as something that is masculine it's just virtues uh like like honor i don't know if we necessarily have that much of a discourse right now currently about virtues so much as about criticisms right I'm, I'm kind of wondering benjamin what are some things tangible examples that come to mind for you when you think about Oh, so we ha we see these examples of different kinds of masculinity around us, but we don't have the theoretical language for it. Can you kind of give me a sense of what it is you're thinking of specifically? Well, I, I just think that there's so many good characters in any given movies. I don't want to do a stupid movie, but I have to get a movie that everybody would know about. Stupid I mean, there's like, fine. what? <laughs> stupid movies are fine. <laughs> okay. There, I, I guess, okay. I, I guess we'll, we'll do Star Wars, um, but we'll do, instead of Luke Skywalker, who's kind of basically this blank template, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, shows the path of, of the wise man, right? Somebody who, who's been there, done that, uh, done that, has made mistakes, but is basically the, the wise teacher, somebody who's uh, interacting with the young hero or with kind of the boy and bringing him up and rearing him in a good fashion. I think there's copious amounts of examples of that that are embedded in our culture that don't necessarily get trotted out as you know positive masculinity it's just it's either masculinity or toxic masculinity right that's a really good point benjamin and i think i think part of the reason that maybe we don't look at say examples like obi-wan kenobi and these really popular movies that i mean they really tap into very early universal narratives at least yeah. in Western culture, about about right and wrong, about goodness, about faith, about uh, the, you know um, transitioning from 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 child to adult, right? I mean, you see these themes playing in Star Wars movies all the time. Um, I think the reason we don't think of that stuff as positive masculinity is because we just have a traditional tendency to view men, their representation, their experiences as the standard for human experience in general. Um, so, so like, will people be like representations of women, Princess Leia? Like, what kind of femininity does she represent? And people won't bat an eyelash if you were to ask a question like that. But if you were to pose a question kind of like yours, Benjamin, where, oh, Obi Wan Kenobi, like, what kind of representation of masculinity might he be? Or what does that tell us about our ideals as Americans and of what a man should be? People be like, what? Like, because hmm. we're not. We're not used to think, it makes us even a little uncomfortable, I think, to think of men that way that we see all the time. And we kind of take them, it's like we take them for granted in a straight, in a, in a wider <laughs> sense of the term. And that's, I because I do, I do quite a bit of work on representations of men, I have to kind of address that all the time, which is, here's why I'm even doing this. Like, here's why I'm analyzing okay. representations of men, because I think, I think we, um, we see men all the time. We hear them all, all the time. They're always on the news. They're always in movies, right? I mean, most protagonists in films are men. Uh, and yet we don't talk about masculinity very much. We don't talk about what these men mean to us very much. And I think we need to start opening up that question. So distinct from uh, talk about talk about men as men rather than not talking about them. Uh, 
because I could we could reverse that. There's plenty of female characters. Uh, sure. It might be the case that there's not as many, uh, or it might be the case that women centric media has a different kind of uh, shelf life and interaction with popular culture than male male generated uh, uh, artworks and stuff like that for wh- sure. whatever reason. And and it could we could do the critique on well we could ask why are men overrepresented, but I think there's plenty of representations of women. I mean, Meryl Streep, uh, we could go through Devil Wears Prada is a great movie. Have you seen that one? I haven't seen it, but I oh, love haven't seen that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Apparently, I have the same personality type as her on the my screen. <laughs> I have an ENTJ, and I'm like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, the, the, the actress or the character in that movie? Exactly. The character, sorry, not Meryl Streep, but her character. Uh, and I'm, but thankfully, thankfully, there are other ENTJs that are they're not quite so sadistic that I'm like, okay, well, maybe it's all right. You know, Margaret Thatcher and 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 uh, and Bill Gates and you know other famous ENTJs. Anyway, I just thought I'd drop that in there. Um, but but that is really interesting, right? Like we. So there are female characters. I mean, you're absolutely right that, and especially in the recent years, you see them spanning into a whole range of different roles and they're yeah, female yeah. villains now. And they're not just only seductresses, like female villains now are much more complex than they used to be. So absolutely, you're right. Um, but I think, I think we, I think in like, even in some popular culture outlets, like even like if I'm thinking of say The Guardian online, it's a popular, I mean, everybody's read The Guardian You'd see a feature on there that talk an opinion piece on there that talks about representations of women and gender, female villains. What does this this mean about our ideas about the relationship between gender and power? Da da da. You don't see that equivalent for talking about men and representations yeah. of men because we just take it for granted that they were always there and we kind of treat them as like again like this degendered standard which is wrong because clearly men must mean something to us if we keep representing them over and over and if they yeah. keep fitting certain kinds of roles they must mean something specifically to us as as pertains to some idea of masculinity or manhood i i can complexify that and just venture th- the question, and I don't have the answer to this question, but it might be the case that there's articles about that is because there is an entire discipline in colleges that produces people who are interested in talking about that, which would loosely be tied to feminism and then it's child gender studies. So gender stu- the academy has produced writers who think about that and want to talk about that men don't necessarily go into that field therefore they're not really interested in producing that kind of artwork or it could even be the case that the uh writing in and of itself or those outlets in and of itself don't attract that kind of uh writer maybe the norman mailer type or the male writer who wants to talk about masculinity goes his own way and doesn't bother with the uh, the Guardian. So there could be some sort of selection bias. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think you've got a point that, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think the, tra- the, the traditional uh, root of any kind of gender studies is in feminism. And, nat- and traditionally, women have been much more interested in women's experiences and fleshing out the meaning of women as well as their representation. So yeah, it is absolutely biased in favor of that. I mean, there are folks like um, like Michael Kimmel who have started like the first, I think, men's studies or masculinity studies program. I think he started it in the 90s. I think it's at Michigan. I don't remember. He's in the Midwest for sure. I don't remember exactly which university, but Michael, I don't know if you've ever read Michael Kimmel. No, you never heard of him. He, he started the first masculinity studies program in the US. Like you can actually get a major in masculinity studies and a major hard on maybe yeah I don't know. <laughs> he's been he's been the uh, he's been spearheading this kind of movement um to really bring much more critical attention to you know masculinity studies what do men mean to us representations of men um and what's really interesting is that in some of the histories he's written about the history of men's studies and our concerns with men is he says, you know, the first men's rights movements or men's rights activism were actually a direct offshoot of the second wave of feminism. 
And in fact, some of the first men's rights activists active in the U.S. in the 70s were there. They looked very different than what we call men's rights activists now. Um, so there's actually like a really deep connection between feminism in the 70s and the emergence of men's rights activism. And early men's rights activists were very much concerned with we don't want to just fit the role of breadwinner and this detached father figure who doesn't get involved in his children's lives or emotional lives. No, we want to we want to have a wider sense, a range of roles as men. We want to tap into the nurturing side of ourselves. We want to have that deep connection to community and our children. We don't want to just be breadwinners. That yeah. was the main platform early on as men's rights activists, which is really interesting because it's so different now than than what we think of as men's rights activism, I think, today. Hmm. Um, and, they, and they totally saw themselves as connected in a way to second wave feminism. They did not hmm. see them as like opposing forces at all. I wonder, um, I haven't dove too deep into um, MRA stuff uh, or men's modern men's rights activism. I'm more interested in people who are different than me. Uh, but it might be the case. There's just something that's coming to my mind right now. Maybe it's like men were cast off from the breadwinner thing and were able to experience all this stuff. But in the process, there's now a generation of men who are now seeking what it means to be a man. They're, they're seeking that source of power or something like that um, and are wrangling with uh, the current world order and how it's changed and trying to find some sense of solidarity in the construct of manhood. Have you drawn on Michael Kimmel's work in your conceptual layer of masculinity? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I want to back up and just say, I'm still trying to figure out what I really understand as masculinity. And there are limitations to what I can do by simple virtue of the fact that I'm a woman. I've never experienced this world as man. I don't know what it's like to be a man. So I also, as deep as my interest is in the other, right, and someone who's different than me, just like what you were saying before, uh, it's it's also interesting pre precisely because there are elements of it that are a mystery to me. So mm -hmm. I will start off and just say that I don't want to make it look like I'm like, yeah, I know everything about men and da da da. Like, no, I mean, I don't. And the fact that I'm a woman, maybe it can help give some other perspective in there that can be valuable. But I also recognize, too, I'll never be able to understand masculinity from the perspective of someone who must embody it and has to live as a man right hmm. Hmm. so uh and i, I mean I, it, it's okay but i recognize that it's a limitation i th um, i i just need to say that that uh, standpoint theory can go a little too far in creating a gulf that's mainly in our mind that shuts sure. down our ability to have compassion and have the imagination to Absolutely. embody the other people so yeah I just, no you're right and thank you for saying that because um i think one of the the negative consequences of this overemphasis on identity politics today is that we are now no longer compelled to look for universal human experiences like we all regardless of being men or women for instance understand the need to feel loved we all want to feel successful we all want to feel relevant in the world we all want to feel a sense of connection to others everybody understands what that's like regardless of whether you're a man or a woman so i i appreciate you saying that because i totally agree which actually gets me to the point that i wanted to share with you when you were asking about when you were asking about my conception of masculinity and like how exactly we go about this, yeah, uh, you sort of touched on this idea of of men starting to feel irrelevant, um, of men starting to feel like, oh my god, well, if I don't have this traditional role of being the breadwinner and the father in the traditional sense, then what do I have? I kept thinking ahead of time when we were planning for this conversation about two terms or statements that have become really popular in the past couple of years, both in social media and in the news and popular culture. And those two statements are one, the crisis in masculinity that you hear kind of thrown around as a statement over and over. Mm -hmm. And the second one, which has become really popular as like a Twitter hashtag or on Instagram, which is the future is female. Hmm. Those two statements I think are connected in the collective unconscious of Americans right now, um, oftentimes in ways that I think we don't recognize. So 
I'm going to start with the future as female, because I think it'll help us to understand the reason that we're seeing discourses about a crisis in masculinity. Uh, people who wanted to start the statement about the future as female were intending to say, women have traditionally been written out of history. Our achievements, our roles, even as mothers have been devalued. They haven't been recognized. We haven't valued or honored feminine contributions to uh, you know, progress and the world and technology and knowledge and human development, all this stuff. And so we want to emphasize that, hey, when we look to our future, we want to show women are really important, right? So the future is female. Now, that's great. And I think that's the positive side of that statement. That the negative consequence of that is, so if the future is female, then one, we're designating the past or history as inherently masculine or male, which is precisely the problem we are trying to fight. And then the second problem with that is, so are you saying that men are irrelevant in the future? Are you saying that men have no kind of active role or positive role in future? Because future is an important word, right? Future, the future is hope. And my God, in the current political moment we're in, God knows we need hope more than anything right now. So when you say the future is female, what you're saying is that men aren't really part of a project of progress or hope. They're not really part of the future and the way we want to envision it. They're not part of imagining what the world could be like and be better in the future. And that is, that is, I think, what brings us to this subconscious fear, I think, in the minds of many Americans, and particularly American men, that about this crisis in masculinity, this, this sense of like, oh my God, well, well, who am I? And why am I so irrelevant? And aren't I still important? And what kind of role can I play? We all want to be relevant not only to ourselves, but to other people in our communities. I mean, we're social animals, right? That's what gives us motivation to wake up out of bed every morning. If men are starting to feel like they're irrelevant and that there is no future, no, there's no place for them in the future, is it any wonder that they're starting to feel this way? Now, this is not to say that I agree with some of the ways that men have tried to deal with this dilemma, because sometimes I think... If, and and you probably have heard about like you know um, these kind of uh, extremist men's rights activists like I think Elliot Rogers and um, the, the there was a men's rights activist in Toronto who like barreled his truck into a whole group of people and most he mostly killed and injured women I think that was intentional these and these guys have issued manifestos and it came to light that they were men's rights activists and they felt that women had taken away all these rights from them and they were very angry and they lashed out in very violent and very destructive ways now obviously i don't think that that is a even remotely okay way to respond to this increasing feeling of being possibly irrelevant or feeling like you've been shoved out of the conversation about what it means to be human and what it means to have hope and building a future together. Men have to play an active role in helping build a future. It just, it just needs to be one that is balanced with and honors the feminine and honors women's mm-hmm. roles as well. I, I think that really is, I think the problem is that traditionally we've treated it as an either or. Uh, and I think the statement, the future is female is unfortunately, it, it's a little bit reactionary in the sense that it's saying, well, no, men have had their turn. Let's just make this only about women now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I understand the kind of cathartic currency that something like that might have and why women are, they're just like so fed up of be, feeling like they've just been irrelevant and invisible, but we can't also turn around and just start treating men like they're irrelevant because God, and we've, we've treated women like they're irrelevant for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Where's that gotten us? Clearly nowhere dead, right? So we can't turn around and just do that to men now. I think men Needs they need space and 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 uh, and time and resources to think about and work out and create a positive masculinity that where they feel like they have a role and they can do something good for themselves. They can do something good for others. They have a connection to a community. They feel like they're a part of something bigger. That's important for everybody, and it's no different for men. Is there then? 
Or do you have um, hopes or dreams that some of the work that you're doing on masculinity could be fitted or offered up to men as useful? Uh, um, are there things that you found, or in other words, are there things that you find in the past that are worth carrying forward or reminding us of? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think if there's anything that, that some of my research say on, I do the research on these paintings that show peasant men or farmer men in the thirties, for instance, that's, that's the work I've mostly been doing thus far on masculinity in my own research. I think if we can learn anything from that and that if there's anything of food for men from that, from that kind of research, it's that you can celebrate certain types of say cultural practices or artistic practices associated with men. Like in the case of the work I do, you know, equestrian sports and, and stick dances from upper Egypt and stuff. And you can celebrate those things. Just don't do it and then try to use it to replace anything valuable artistic that women do. Try to see the things that men do as a cultural practice, as something that complements and sits side by side with, with the kinds of practices or things that women do, like textile <laughs> arts, embroidery, uh, certain types of dance and musical practices that women particularly undertake in rural Egypt in the 30s that didn't get the kind of exposure, that didn't get the kind of celebration or credit it deserved in those days. So I think I think that's a one, I, I know that that's a very like specific kind of example in another culture and another time and place that maybe is not so tangible for Americans today. But I think we can just learn that um, you can be a man who, is proud of being a man and celebrates your masculinity and celebrates the kind of strength that comes with that without without necessarily feeling like you have to denigrate the feminine or to to look at women and think well you don't bring anything of value or, or you're irrational or you're emotional so that brings no value no that that's a that's a mistake right it's a mistake that we think we've made in the past oh, okay. uh, yeah is that does that make sense at all yeah i just i don't I don't see that that necessarily follows that if you are uh, bringing up the goodness of men, you have to append to don't be bad to women to that. Like, I don't even see how maybe the next step then is uh, what is the proper uh, relationship towards women, which is a huge conversation, especially now with the categories of male and female being blown wide open uh, currently. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I think, I, I, so I personally think that men and their relationship with women, um, I think that, and this is, this is such a hard question to answer, Benjamin, it's such a good one. The first thing I think of is, I think men should try to treat women with the decency and respect that they would hope they would get just as a human being and, and at that, while also recognizing that perhaps women are biologically different than you, uh, that women do things a little differently than you. And perhaps, I don't know, maybe there are biological reasons that men and women behave certain ways that are different or think certain ways that are different. I'm not here to debate the nature versus nurture. We don't really know for sure, right? But to honor the difference and to not act like, well, everything that men do is great. And then the things that women bring are just kind of like, is really, that, really is great. that something that you see? Is that a pattern that you see in our culture? Um, I think recently it's been changing quite a bit, but like when I think about like more traditional understanding of power, for instance, okay. like okay. You're at the workplace or something like that. Traditional understandings of power is you've got the commander figure, he kind of like tells everybody what to do, and then they do it, and then that's that. And that's been, and that by the way, I'm not saying that there are women who don't do that, or that, oh, only men do that, and then that's like a masculine way of navigating the world. I'm not arguing that, because I don't, I don't agree with that argument, by the way. Um, but I, I think there is this, this idea about like what a man should be traditionally that 
that relies a little too much on this kind of top down approach where like he's the commander and then everything Mm. else. And I also think too, like traditional ideas of what a father should be, have been a little, um, they can be a little negative. Like the idea that the dad is only a breadwinner, but he shouldn't have any kind of emotional connection to his kids. Like he just comes home, he has his dinner, he reads his paper, you leave him alone, you call him Mister if you're the kid, and like that's it. I mean, those those kinds of it's it's like I think that thankfully we've I think many of us have moved beyond that old model, um, which is a good thing. So I I guess those are the kinds of examples that I that I think of, and I also think too to not be like hyper vigilant about defending your masculinity. Like if you run into a woman who just acts in ways that you don't think are traditionally feminine and maybe you're not personally nuts about, if you don't like it, that's fine, but don't lash out at her. Don't act in ways that would, uh, you know, like, I mean, I, I, I've dealt with this, some of this stuff online in the past where like, okay, really don't like some of the things I have to say and they'll say terrible things about my voice or the way I look or they'll lash out at me. I'm talking about stuff like that. I'm not talking okay. like okay. two people just having a simple disagreement about ideas, right? Like, yeah. It does, but does that kind of help give you a sense of like there's this traditional model and then on the other hand, you've got sometimes some guys are a little vigilant about defending their masculinity and the way that it comes out can be like kind of um, hmm. okay. a little disrespectful i <sighs> but if you just like don't feel don't feel don't hold back on challenging me on this because i'm kind of curious to know like where you're coming from with this well I'm, I'm trying to i'm trying to contextualize that because when you're describing these instances i'm like well does this happen and if i even say that in certain discourses it's like you're blind to that right i, I have spoken to mm. very died in the world uh, Died in the wool feminists who present a very fraught uh, e- experience of women and culture that I am not necessarily aware of because of my uh, because I am exempt from dealing with that because I am a man. But I also compose myself in such a way that I don't act that way. So that behavior isn't around me because I don't uh, propagate that behavior, and my interactions with human beings are rather minimal because I live outside of town and I have very, uh, you know, I'm very selective with how I interact with the internet. But sure. at the same time, when we, when we upload everything into the internet, I do see a lot of behavior that is kind of sexed behavior where men can get rather aggressive or very demeaning, uh, with regards to women. I also see a lot of that from the other side too. Uh, when you brought up, uh, UN women, at least their American presence on Twitter is very regressive, very talking about mansplaining and very <laughs> condescending, this really wa- distilled, watered down version of meme feminism, which is very easy to ridicule because it reduces them, first of all, into these whining little brats. And then it, it shows their conception of men to be so frail that they right. have to uh, sequester what it means for a man to talk to a woman to either be completely in agreement with her or else he is mansplaining to her. So they put out that word mansplaining that then has been repeated over and over again in the last week to kind of, uh, to put down any sort of man in a political sense, to put down a man because there's no possibility that he could possibly know what he's talking about and has the right to do that. So there are versions. It's really difficult to enter into this critique because there are so many representations of bad faith arguments or bad behavior on both sides. So I, I think that it's, it's better at this point in the conversation, just thinking about it and watching it for, you know, the, the men's rights and the feminist uh, kind of conversation, the next step of the conversation is to kind of just focus on the good, is to really adulate and carve out what it means to be yeah. a good person. And then the question is, what is it particularly about the man that makes it makes him masculine what what are we talking about when we talk about masculinity and sure. is there some sort of uh conception of that 
that yeah. uh, I don't know Michael came up, Mr. Kimmel came up, Professor Doctor Kimmel came up with, or that <laughs> you use in your research. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, my perceptions of what good masculinity are are going to be inherently biased by my my own place that I am in life right now too. Like, oh, okay. And yeah, I like, and I think it's totally okay to acknowledge that. I mean, you you have to try to achieve a level of objectivity with your arguments. But like, okay, like I'm 35 now. Um, I'm in a committed relationship. It, you know, it's but but I'm starting to get to an age where, and full disclosure, I'm not ashamed of sharing this. But I'm only speaking for myself. I'm getting to an age where. I do wonder, like, am I going to get older and not get any attention anymore from men, for instance, right? So now I interpret men flirting with me or the idea of that much more positively than I did in my 20s. Because it's, like, it's, it's a scarce resource. So <laughs> yeah, I was in my 20s. It was like, I couldn't get them away from me. Like, it was horrible. I'm like, get away. Yeah. But, but to, to answer, so my idea of good masculinity is... I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's also, you kind of talked about like, what does it mean to be a good human before? Yeah. You know, every single person's different too. I don't want to also like pigeonhole and say, well, all good men should act exactly like this or something. Every single person's different, right? I just think a basic sense of empathy and respect is just something everybody should have. I think we should start from there. So I actually yeah. am agreeing with you on this. And I and I do I do see your point too about like the whole I mean, God, every single time a, a man might disagree or try to give a rebuttal to an argument, it's mansplaining. Like really? Like yeah. isn't there I thought that there was like a type of particular attitude that constituted mansplaining, not like anything that comes out of a man's mouth is mansplaining. Like that's just dumb. Everything because- gets politicized. It's, it's, but it's like, but that again is that obsession with identity politics that I think we were hinting at before. I have a real problem with that, actually. I'm not going to like wither away and die like a snowflake just because some guy disagrees with me. Like we can have a debate (laughs) about this stuff and I'm totally fine. And you know what? If I end up being wrong or he ends up being wrong, the sky, like the sky's not going to cave in or fall in. It's going to be fine. So, um, so I think we need to acknowledge that too. And I agree with you. I don't think that we should try to turn a whole group of people into like just the villain or the demon here. That's Mm -hmm. not, that's not productive for us at all. I think one of the things that is difficult about the conversation around masculinity and femininity is because there's like when we describe masculinity in a certain respect, we are describing what women find attractive and what men find attractive in men it's it's really a social thing right it's the masculinity one it 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 makes other men like you and two it makes other women like you or you know with these social structures built in when we have uh like when when you're talking about a traditional society where women are very tightly controlled then where is the, the it's almost like men's behavior degrades because they don't have feedback from the women of what the the women don't have a voice. So the masculinity or male behavior isn't regulated so well because they've overregulated the women. And so opening up that feedback loop of women and men allows us to really investigate and explore and modulate our natural behaviors or our different energies and sculpt ourselves into something that's pleasant for other people. Yeah, yeah, it's a pleasant, so nice word, right? Um, but I think that's a really good point. Uh, yeah, there needs that that feedback loop that you talked about. I really like this idea of that kind of the back and forth, the reciprocity, the, you know, being able to really like talk together as equals about like, okay, like this is what you do that makes me feel this way or this is what's valuable to me and this is this is the value that I see in you. There needs to be that feedback loop, absolutely. And on top of the uh, friendship or courtship, there's also the interfamily dynamics of male typical and female typical behavior and also societal pressures forcing the man into a position where he has to work so hard to support his family or, you know, or or with a two parent home or two uh, parent. 
two professional parent home. I don't. There's a, the so correct the way of saying household. Is that dual kind of income like household? Right. <laughs> which which it, that completely shapes everything. And there is, of course, demands on women. Uh, you know, largely speaking, to take care of the child. And there's part of that is informed by uh, biology, and part of it is expectations. And I understand conversations around that. I was a preschool teacher for a number of years, right? I so I served those dual income families. I was kind of part-time dad for a lot of these kids, right? And yeah. the entering into that domain is a whole other discussion around masculinity and femininity because that uh, industry is 97% female or something like that. You know, it's like a very small percent are males. And when I entered into that, I'm like, do I belong here? How do I be this? How do I be a man in this environment? That was a really interesting question to kind of think through. Like, what is my role here? How do I, what, what are my talents served at? And then how do I have to attenuate my personality to a gynocracy like this is this is a place that's ruled <laughs> by women you know so i have to be outnumbered yeah. yeah yeah that's really interesting right i mean it's interesting that you were in a situation where because you were working with so many women it got you to kind of think and reflect on okay who am i as a man and what parts of my masculinity can safely enter this space <laughs> and what other things do i have to like hold back or like cut off yeah, in yeah. order to yeah, yeah i mean yeah. i think that some women who go into like really high-ranking professional uh roles like if they're a ceo or an executive officer at a corporation they kind of it's interesting they deal with that similar type of question like what is my femininity as a woman? I'm working with like all these men, like all these suits, right? And who am I amidst all this? Do I belong here? What elements of my womanly self do I have to like rein in because I'm in this space in order to be taken seriously, in order for people mm -hmm. to trust me? So it's just interesting that you bring that up because it seems like men and women who go into professions, for instance, that don't fit the traditional stereotype of what a man or a woman should do respectively, we have to confront those kinds of questions. Yeah, and make it up. I think it's, um, I think it, there's a push or there, there's a, a version of activism that would want us to not just make, how do I say this and not be offensive? Uh, I think that if you're a high, if you're a That's woman awesome. entering a high power, uh, mostly masculine uh, space, I think that there 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 are ways for harassment to be uh, disallowed or certain behaviors to change for the men where that would be unseemly, like unprofessional, right? But I think that there might be a push to try to destroy that culture in a way or, dis or, or to try to change it so that it's more am amenable to a woman where that culture is actually so high powered because it's channeling so much energy, right? It's, it's also doing a lot of work. So there are a lot of norms that have been built up that aren't just sex, uh, sexist or patriarchal. They, sure. they were naturally uh, driven by the amount of work or the type of work that was going on in that environment. So I'm, right. I'm just trying to, um, like I wouldn't, I would never go into a preschool and demand that they changed for me. I had to adapt to that <laughs> environment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, you, you really, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I think this is a really interesting point, and I'll say this as an ENTJ woman, uh, I recognize exactly what you're talking about too, right? Because it's like, you, there are certain ways where, like, yeah, you go into a workplace and you, you should not have to tolerate like. In offensive, inappropriate remarks from people or behavior that is like made intentionally to make you feel excluded. Of course not. Nobody would ever want to deal with that. But there are certain ways, like I'll enter certain spaces where it might be really male dominated. And also there is this culture that may not necessarily be like sexist, but there's like, you got to speak your mind you have to advocate for yourself you have to be assertive and all these things and it's like it's you, you know you got to learn how to adapt to those things too I, I i it's kind of interesting you say this benjamin and i'm not sure where this is where you were going but it's making me think about some of the developments in say like college education and teaching where 
um, we are being, as professors are being encouraged to keep adapting and readapting our teaching methods to be amenable to quote unquote diversity or all sorts of learning types. And one of the things I've noticed that I really don't agree with that's arisen in this environment is this idea that like, well, a lot of young women are much more scared to raise their hand and speak in class. So therefore need to measure participation, not by how much people are speaking in class, but you need to measure their participation by, you know, say you can use a discussion board online where people can write their answers to a question and be anonymous and not have to speak in class. And then that way you can account for different types of learning. Now, I don't totally agree with that because in order to survive in this world beyond college, you have to know how to advocate for yourself. And that means advocating for yourself out loud. It means being able to deal with people who maybe don't agree with you, but you're able to, of course, respectfully and civilly, you know, disagree or give a rebuttal or come up, you know, in team working for solutions to problems where not everybody on your team is going to see things the way you do. If you're constantly adapting and readapting yourself to all these different types of learning methods and also stereotypes that we tend to put on female yeah. students about them being passive and quiet and all this stuff, you're actually reinforcing you're actually reinforcing social dynamics that at, that disadvantage these female students. So what you shouldn't be doing is hmm. being like, no, to survive in this world, you have to ad adopt certain types of practices that we do tend to associate with men or masculinity, whether for better or for worse, maybe that's not a legitimate association, but regardless, you have to learn how to do these things in order to find a job that you're happy with, be successful in the world. I mean, college, we're preparing them for the working world. I mean, that is essentially what we're doing. So I, yeah, I mean, I, I disagree with this attitude that you should always um, make every single thing you do with students or with coworkers totally amenable to their preferences because you have to also learn adaptability. And I don't think that it's necessarily wrong or inherently wrong for people to need a certain level of assertiveness and charisma and drive in order to be successful in any kind of job. I mean, there's a reason that human beings are drawn to those with charisma and ambition and like being able to deal with big ideas and to say it and articulate that out loud. And there's a legitimate reason that people are drawn to that. And I, yeah. I don't, I don't want to come off as like, like egotistical or arrogant when I say that, but like, I have a tendency to veer towards those kinds of things. And I think, you know, my being a woman has not stopped me from doing that. And I don't think it should stop other young women. I don't think it should. And I think if anything, I can maybe, hopefully I can serve as a role model for some of those female students to be like, Hey, like you can do these things as a woman and you don't have to sacrifice all of your femininity when you do that, like you can still <laughs> live a happy life and, and be assertive <laughs> in the workplace. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There is a very troubling trend and it, it's probably best encapsulated by a book. Uh, well, Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt wrote, wrote a book, uh, the coddling of the American mind. I and, I've One of the chapters was based on the saying, prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. And increasingly, especially over the last 20 years, we have adapted our institutions, especially of education, to cater to the desires of the, you know, of the youth to such an extent that they are now behaving like spoiled brats. And just, uh, just this week, a school district, the second largest school district in California, being San Diego, has now made uh, has now made it. They they looked at the data and they said, okay, well we're failing this percentage of Black people, this percentage of Hispanics, this percentage of they they broke it up into race. They saw that white people are not getting uh, failed as much. They completely leave off the Asians, right? They don't they don't mention how right. well the Asians are doing. About, they never talk about Asians and they never talk about Arabs. We've been completely subsumed. I don't understand. It's like why do they never talk about us anyway? You're doing too good, I guess, right? 
I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's so, going on with that. So in order, so so they look at the disparities. They say that we are an anti-racist institution. So our job is to fix those disparities. So in order to solve failure, they've eliminated success. They they they're uh, decreasing their no cheat rule. They're decreasing their attendance rules, uh, like turning in homework on time is not a part of your grade anymore. All these other, like even grades themselves are not a part of your grade. So in order to solve the problem on paper, they're completely ruining an entire generation. They're completely betraying yeah. by not tackling the real problem. And the real problem is probably really sticky. It's like, who's motivating these? What are the cultural norms? Right. Uh, how can we help these different culture groups to perform better? Better, or maybe they don't want to be in academia. How can we serve, uh, you know, like like build more shops or build more hands-on kind of training, build more trade schools for these different cultures? If this is what really interacts with the the kids and and their home environment better, why can't we serve them that way? But they're they're instead of they're eradicating success. They're right. eradicating everything that would allow somebody to actually go forth and build that generational wealth and, and build those things that, that would uh, help those communities in the long run. Right. I mean, I, I think there's, so I think one of the biggest problems is that colleges are now running on a corporate model. So the students are not- How long have you been in academia then? I mean, like I've had my full-time job now for two and a half years. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm relatively new to this. Okay. Um, I started at Skidmore in 2018, um, but I've been, but I've been, of course, I've been in academia as a PhD student, and I was teaching part time on and off for a couple of years before that. So okay. I've had several years' experience for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if you've seen firsthand kind of the the change. Yeah, at, and in fact, I I even see changes that progress over the course of semesters. Um, and this is, and I'm talking like. It, so this is really interesting because we have like the increasing amount of students who just deal with anxiety and the way that anxiety like really kind of throws a wrench into their ability to engage with material in the work. And that's a whole other conversation. Maybe we can get into that later because I don't want to go off track and ramble. But that's I think the, big, the biggest problem that we're seeing and this kind of goes to uh, is it Jonathan Haidt? And I'm sorry, I forgot the name of Luke the off. Greg Luke Lukianoff. Greg Lukianoff. One of the roots of the problem they identify is the fact that the, the, the universities increasingly run on a corporate model. So now the students are not just students in the traditional sense, they're customers. So in order to, and, and now the professors are, are increasingly, our role has become very complicated in the sense that we're not just bestowers of knowledge anymore. We're not just people who help direct their research focus or whatever. We are now also having to be like counselors yeah. and having to like change a lot of the things that we do uh, in order to adapt to each and every single student. Now, I'm fine with some adaptability. And in fact, the more I do that, the more I learn and the more I learn about myself. So I don't see it as a totally negative thing. But um, when you treat students like customers, uh, what you end up doing is treat professors like they are customer service agents and nannies. And uh, and I'm going to go out on a limb and just say that I could get in a lot of trouble for saying this stuff, but it's fine. It's like I'm not going to hold back. Um, but I, I do think that there is a – I think the best thing to do if we want to have and retain more students of color or more students who are first generation, meaning that they are the first in their families to go to college, if we want to retain them more, it's not – you don't take away like – oh, to reduce their cheat requirements or not require them to participate. And that's just putting them in a pigeonhole where like, oh, well, it's not as important for you to be there in class. I mean, that is literally the consequence of something like that. If we want to retain these students and keep them in and have them be successful, get degrees, go out there and get awesome jobs and make a difference in the world, we need to like increase faculty diversity. Maybe we give them more mentors that have had experiences a little more like theirs, right? Now, of course, that can also go awry too, because sometimes when people think of faculty diversity, they think of the optics of it, right? They wanna make sure that the prof new professor that they've just gotten on looks different enough and that therefore the students will turn to them as mentors. That's a problem, okay? You don't know what somebody's experiences are just because of like what you perceive as their race, for instance. That's ridiculous. 
But I think that we, we need to find other more positive ways to encourage students to be successful in college and give them other kinds of incentives like mentorship, um, uh, different kinds of programs that are established that help students make that transition. If they're first generation, there are programs that are called, like opportunity programs that help students like make adjustments like, oh, I never knew that we had to do this thing in college because my mom and dad never told me about it because they never went to college. I mean, that's a that's a that's a legitimate that's a legitimate challenge for somebody to deal with where their other peers in class are just like they're breezing through or, you know, they're just doing things effortlessly because their parents went to college and there's things they take for granted about. Um, so I, I think that I think that things like those special programs geared towards helping students transition and mentorship structures are much more beneficial than like just taking away requirements to engage or participate or not cheat. Like that's that's ridiculous. That's a that's this is the problem. Like that's like an upper administration kind of technique where you just come up with like set kind of like wrote rules and then you try to apply it to a experience as complex as an educational experience in college. That's a complex experience. You know, if you're not going to require your students to like come to class or whatever, that's like, well, then what, what's the point of all this, if that's the hmm. case? Um, and it's also making a lot of really, I think, very offensive assumptions too about students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, some of my most brilliant and hardworking students or students who are students of color from immigrant backgrounds from families that maybe their family members have never even been to college. So I, I, I'm even kind of offended that colleges would come up with these kinds of rules like this. I think that's really making a lot of flagrant assumptions too. I've seen a lot in over the last three years since I've been watching this happen unfolding, it unfolded around me and then I've been following the story. Um, that it, in an odd way, it disadvantages uh, certain people from becoming professors, or it ends up uh, that a certain kind of type of professor ends up getting in trouble and kicked out of college, and it's usually a male with kind of autistic-ish traits, people who are not good counselors, people who are not... <laughs> don't have social skills and and they don't the have people social cues. yeah they don't have social cues or or they're rather brazen in one way or another yeah. and if the academy loses that that type of personality you're you're losing also that drive and that energy and that exactitude too uh you know that that is kind of male typical maybe maybe a little bit more hard sciences stuff that that will really erode the academy when it becomes a service model it really betrays it's it, it, the drive for truth and the drive for knowledge. And then you have these jingle jangle things about justice that come in and replace the higher ideals of truth, right? That, yeah. that are actually more in service, not of true, uh, not of social justice, but of covering the asses of all those administrators who are playing the, these dominoes in their, uh, I don't know, they don't have an ivory tower. What's the color of the administration building? Brick. Okay, so they're in their brick. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the, the brick fortress. Bastille. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Bastille, the brick fortress. Do you think this is a this is a question that um, I'm going to try to ask Glenn Lowry when I have him on. Hopefully, I'll have him on. He's a, a intellectual titan and a hero of mine. He's a, a professor at Brown University Economics. Okay. But uh, a, a professor that I know at Evergreen State College that I'm in contact with, he really thinks that the academy is is done. It's over. <laughs> They've lost credibility. Uh, they're gone down a track. It, it's a pretty cynical view. It's It's gone down this track of, you brought up corporatization. There's also um, certain ideological factions that have way more sway than they should. Do you think that from your position, are you worried about the academy? What are some of the things that you think need to happen in order for it to maintain Maintain its status as an institution of knowledge, and do you see that as at risk right now, or do you think that that is overblown? I think that our fears about things in this day and age do tend to be overblown in general, but I will say that I am worried a bit about the academy, particularly because of this that you're talking about the service model, the corporate model that tends that we're tending to follow that is going to really hurt the integrity of the ac academy. And I think we've seen how that's played out already. But 
to say that the academy is done is to imply that one we can never change for the better and two that the academy is uh, a completely undynamic unchanging entity and that is a problem because if you think about really old systems of higher education like the medieval period in europe when they had the arts liberalis we'd learn about the liberal arts you'd learn latin science math and then some other kind of thing and then and then you got your degree and you had like a mentor kind of like mm. higher authority and you got your degree and that was it i mean the robes that we wear as phds today at commencement ceremonies are literally they are stemming from the medieval period right but our universities have changed a lot since the medieval period we do very different things now than we've done in the past that doesn't mean that universities say in the 1980s are well that's it we're dead the academy's over because it's not like some earlier precedent i think we need to give some credit to academic institutions to have the ability to adapt and change in positive ways. I don't think that change is always an inherently bad thing. Um, I think one of the main ways that we can save the university and then also make it better too, it's not just about preserving, it's about adapting and changing for the better, yeah. um, is to start moving away from a corporate model. But in order to do that, we need the Ministry of Education to stop cutting so much funding to universities. Because the more and more that the government's Ministry of Education cuts funding... Hold on. For the American audience, you're talking about the Department of Education, sorry, right? Department, yes, I'm sorry. I meant the Department of Education. I know you're Canadian in origin and Egyptian in origin, <laughs> too. So, Yeah, it's, I think that's what the Egyptian side of my brain that was working in there. <laughs> the Department of Education, has it's been cutting funds to education now since since the 2000s right but the most drastic cuts have taken place over the past four to five years and um the more that universities cannot rely on the government for money the more they have to rely on things like tuition and boarding for their bread and butter and that means charging students more tuition uh it's nearly it's like almost impossible to go to college now unless you're either really upper class or you're you're poor and you got financial aid um, and that's actually a, a demographic pattern that we're seeing in student bodies increasingly over the years. The middle class is kind of getting cut out of universities in terms of students. Uh, so we need to we need to get funding from government, from the Department of Education that is robust, that sustains the integrity of the academy, so that we're not having to rely on corporate interests and private donors and the the bread and butter of tuition and board we really need to move away from that and then that way too um we also need structurally to move away from taking a, advantage of and exploiting adjunct faculty we need to have more tenure and tenure track lines for faculty so not just recycling disposable people in and out of these teaching positions it's detrimental to the university that's detrimental to students is that uh, that's another cost cutting or, or uh, bean counting uh, decision? Absolutely, because these adjunct faculty, they don't have health benefits. They don't have contracts. They're paid very, very little for the amount of work that they're doing. And they're no less qualified to do the work than their tenure track or tenured colleagues are. Hmm. Yeah. Five steps to saving the academy with Laura Ayad. <laughs> Yeah. I really hope that I, I really hope that we can find some ways to to save the academy and also make it better to adapt yeah. as well for the better, right? Um, yeah. It's not just you bring up good things. Yeah. Yeah. Why, um, one one last question for today: sure. Why did you end up living the academic life? What were the uh, what was the dream or the destiny that you found there? in those hallowed halls. And have you just been a lifelong student? You went directly to uh, college from high school and then have just been in it? Yeah. Yeah, I've always liked learning. I've always liked being a student. Uh, and I even found that early on, I think even when I was in high school, I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed sharing what I think I know with others and then seeing how they respond and react. So I think, I think the teaching element was something there. And I also... I just love, ex I've always loved exploring 
ideas in depth. I've loved the kind of sleuthing aspect of being a researcher because professors are there. We're like detectives and we try to find information about topics that a lot of other people don't know about and ask new questions of them and go digging in archives and go doing interviews and, and finding more information. I mean, there's something really invigorating about something like that. I think I always knew I liked those things and I did go straight to college after high school, but I did take about a one to two year break between undergrad and grad school, which I'm really glad that I did because it gave me some time to work and mature and travel and just kind of figure things out before I went and started my PhD program. So it was more about the process rather than the institution then? Just this was the kind of work that you wanted to do? Yeah. Yeah. I think some people, I think a lot of folks who are academics or got their PhDs, they like the process a lot. And I enjoy like coming up with new methods for teaching my students about things I'm either an expert on and a lot of things I'm not necessarily an expert on, right? It's, it's fun to explore those things with, with, you know, eager young minds. Um, so I think I enjoy that, but I also like enjoy just sharing about my research with other people who are in my field or in related fields. And I think that at the core, many of us in academia really do want to to affect positive change and i don't mean in the strictly like political sense or the superficial sense that you're thinking of when you're thinking of like the the brunch protest kind of you know like protest is the new brunch i'm not talking about that i'm talking about the deep thinking the deep work of of changing the way we think about the world of changing the questions that we ask of it that's really that to me at least is uh something that motivates me Congratulations for reaching the end of the podcast. If you enjoyed this product, consider donating to this channel via paypal.me slash Benjamin Boyce or joining me on Patreon. Also follow me on Twitter at Benjamin A. Boyce. Have a good night.